You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, Jared Buskovich. He's the co-founder of Wow Yow, W-O-W-Y-O-W, wowyow.com. And they provide something called Visual AI, which we'll get into. So, Jared, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for having me, Richard. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so tell me about Wow Yow. What's the premise of the company? Yeah, well, Wow Yow is, a, uh, like you mentioned, a visual AI company. We're in the digital media space. And our AI is used to automatically identify, index, search, and monetize visual content. So this is the native video and images found across, you know, web content, apps, uh, and soon OTT and connected devices. So we're Mm -hmm. unlocking uh, new opportunities for, you know, media companies to um, have an AI that sees everything that's in the video content itself, people, places, products, things, and more. And then, you know, indexes them as new metadata. Um, and then once you use that, you can, you know, leverage it and create all kinds of use cases and applications from that data itself. Yeah. So if you consider a picture, um, and then we'll talk about a video after, but if you consider a picture, what kind of data would you want to extract from the picture to make it useful in search? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, across the web, there's all the native editorial content um, anywhere you go on your favorite website that you're just looking at, you know, a sports image, um, you know, from the basketball game last night and you want to know who that player was or, you know, he's wearing some really cool sneakers. So we use um, computer vision and image recognition to identify and index, you know, the people, places, products and more within that visual content. And then on the end user side, allow people to search everything they see. So as an end user, if you're saying, wow, who is this person? Um, you know, you can click and interact and engage to find out more information um, or shop the everything that you see. So is this going to be for the uh, content creators where they can choose to show overlays or uh, interactive elements in a given video? Or is it for individuals that, you know, whether the content creator wants to or not, uh, you can, you know, see who's in a video or see what sneakers they're wearing and that kind of thing? Yeah, great question. We work directly with the the publishing houses and the content creators um, to give them our AI technology that unlocks the image and the videos um, data inside of it. So we help them generate, you know, all this additional data and then further engage their audience and help them monetize that asset. Is there any uh, video footage where um, that can be blocked? You know, if someone wanted to keep certain things private, if they could um, take a face in the video and, I don't know, somehow pixelated or make it where it could not be an AI could not identify it for some reason. Yeah. Or, out, out, you know, some kind of a yeah. steganography that tells the AI <laughs> not process it. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. You know, so in terms of like the AI side, there's the technicalities of what we can, you know, we're capable of. And then there's the business relationship with the actual media brands itself. And that's where you have the intersection between technology and human and account management. So, you know, up front you're working directly with the media publishers saying, you know, maybe you don't want this technology on hard news per se, or maybe the use case is a little bit differently for that hard news where you're identifying uh, right now, brand safety is a big concern. So you're identifying, you know, a gun in the video, and then you're flagging that content for brand safety. So we work directly with the publishers up front to, to look at the different use cases that they can use the AI and then put that into the technology itself. Um, you know, and use all the various algorithms to help like, unlock the content. But then also there's a human element, right? And you have to make sure that you're monitoring the systems um, to adhere to the integrity of those partnerships. What is brand safety? That's an example of that. You know, example of brand safety right now, it's a really big concern in the media and advertising industry where big brands and advertisers are pulling millions of dollars because they see a, you know, an advertisement for soap alongside 
you know, a gun story, a hard news article talking about, you know, a murder that recently happened. So it may not be perfectly aligned with the brand integrity and their objective as a company. So brand safety ensures that, you know, your brand is matched with good brand safe content. Um, so there's a huge shift in the industry to ensure that and uphold those standards. And being a technology provider, using, you know, image recognition uh, and identifying additional context within that image or video helps enable those and facilitate those relationships a lot better because now you can prove it with technology. How do you uh, make the searches efficient? You know, if you have um, five videos to go to or 500 videos to go through and they're 20 minutes long, you know, how do you make this search not exhaustive and crippling and how do you get it done quickly? Yeah, so that's the beauty of the IP that, you know, our technology team and our product team has been working on for all these years is building this with scale in mind from the beginning. I think early days, you know, the concept of interactive and shoppable video has always been around, but it was always this kind of one-to-one ratio where they were doing it manually um, and it was very resource heavy. So, you know, when we start building our algorithms and our tech stack, you have to look at it from a very at scale production, you know, from what servers you're using to what type of engines you've built um, to how fast can you process video content itself. And then you enter the side of it, which is what's worth identifying, you know, what is worth it to that media company's goals. Um, Are they, you know, if it's a media company, that's a sports focused media site. Do you really need to identify the tree in the background? Not necessarily, because, you know, what you're looking for is the opportunity to help them generate revenue. And based off of, you know, some of the audience interests, you know that you're able to identify relevant context, relevant to their audience, to the content itself. And that creates a, you know, a business opportunity to then monetize that asset rather than looking at it as a whole and processing every single item. Although we can, we also take a business approach and go after the goals of the client. Well, how do you monetize a certain piece of content? Would you modify it to make things appear there that didn't appear? Like, you know, a generic soda can all of a sudden has a Pepsi logo on it somehow? No. Yeah. So we don't do any like the visual augmentation right now. Um, we thought it'd be really cool in the future. And I know there's a few successful companies who do some really cool technology around that. But what our technology does is once we identify, let's say, you know, the Chevy truck in a uh, video content piece, what we're able to do is unlock that as an ad opportunity. So now as the end user, if you're watching this video clip and you're watching what's that one show, uh, carpool karaoke, and they may be driving a certain vehicle or whatever, if the user and end user is interested in learning more, they can click on it, they can engage with it. Um, it'll take them to, you know, that vehicle site where they can learn more information. Or on the flip side, the advertiser can promote a marketing message. So we have a variety of different ad formats and ad products that you can either leverage the content itself to drive the traffic over to the advertiser or, you know, leverage the content and then showcase the marketing message that aligns with the marketer and the brand goals. Have you uh, have there been studies to show that uh, when you're marketing X, it tends to go with Y and Z, and if you show them together, it has a synergistic effect. Or you know, how do you know what to show with what? Yeah, so we, have, you know, it all depends really. I think when we early days, what we saw was it really just depends on the context of the video itself or the visual representation, and then the audience. You know, what are they more likely to engage with? If it's a fashion media company, obviously their audience is tuned in to watch that content and to shop looks, etc. So you align your AI to identify the most likely relevant context within there that the users are going to interact, engage, and shop with. Um, But what we found also is it's not just from a commerce perspective that the users are more interested in learning. It's also from an informational standpoint. You know, they want to know who is this person. They want to know the location, the music in the background. So through a wide range, you know, what we did up front was allow users to interact and engage with a lot of elements in the video itself. And then you hone in on that specific relationship with that media partner to look at the data and say, oh, wow, you know, 80% of users on your site click on the commerce or, you know, 70% of users on this site are more aligned with clicking and learning more about the people seen in the video. So over time, you know, with AI and the algorithms and all the insights we have in the background, you're able to align more with the goals of the user and of the um, purpose. So what are some examples of preferences people have had and watching video content that surprised you? I think one of their main goals on like the sports site is enabling not only the commerce, but just real-time 
you know, knowing who these new players are. And if you're not, you know, you're not knowledgeable of some of these players and these highlights, you can interact and click on them and it'll take you to their stats um, and just identifying who people are. Even with movies, we have, um, you know, a lot of publishers who are in the film and entertainment and, you know, this works on top of trailers. So a lot of times we see instead of people wanting to learn more about the products and the places, it's just new talent that people are learning more from. So they go to their social pages and they follow them. Um, so it's really unique depending on the, the publisher and who's hosting the content. But it's really cool to see each one's very different. Um, some sites gear more towards commerce. Some are more informational based. Have you seen that men or women or, you know, kids or you know, different uh, cultural backgrounds look at different things and care about different things? Absolutely. But I think for us, you know, we play on the side of just being agnostic. So, you know, it's not wow yow kind of dictating what we're going to allow the users to, you know, visually search. Um, we're providing our software and our solution to the publishers who have that audience already, right? So if it's a company like I talked about before in the film industry, um, we actually have one very successful publisher who's in the film and horror news who talks all about, about uh, all the different horror films that come out. And when you allow them to interact and learn who they are, and we play kind of the agnostic role, the data proves itself, right? And then we just keep going and allowing their viewers to do that. Oh, but you don't make any suggestions? Oh, it looks like uh, your viewers, for some reason, they really focus in on, you know, this person out of all the characters. There seems to be a great interest in that person. Or, you know, yeah, that so that, that, yeah, that's a great point. And that's to the side of more of like the insights, the audience insights. And within our platform, we actually have an insights page where, you know, our partners can look and see what their audience is interested in. They can see which content they're watching, you know, what viewers are interacting with, what they're engaged with. Um, so they can constantly not only use that for knowledge of what their audience is doing, but also to inform future content production or adapt, you know, their content in bed to align with what's working for them. Well, I figured, you know, you can't say exactly who, of course, or I don't know how much you can say, but, you know, what kind of audience insights have you seen that surprised you or you thought were really cool or insightful to you? Yeah, I'd say some fascinating ones is that regardless of when a content is hosted, um, stuff can go through trend cycles, you know, and it's kind of fascinating to see from like a consumer perspective, if there's a, you know, a video may go viral for one week and then, you know, get all the views and people are engaged and interacting. Like on this horse side, we saw something really cool. Um, I think it was last year during Halloween time, there was that Jason, you know, Freddie and Jason, Jason was in a underwater, there was a clip of the maskless sound underwater in some, I think, Minnesota lake. And, you know, the video went viral on their platform and all the viewers wanted to know where they can buy this mask or just who created this content piece. And it, you know, it spiked all the engagement charts, had something like 40, 50 percent engagement um, users clicking on that to learn more. And then it dives down, but then it recirculated, you know, six months later and saw another spike. So it's, it's interesting from like a content consumption standpoint, looking at trends and saying, oh, wow, you know, this peaked at this certain time and it dropped. But then, you know, went viral again, but now the users are interested in something different. Um, now they're clicking on the people because they want to know the production studio versus the mask. Maybe during Halloween time, they were shopping for the mask. So it's cool for us to look on the back end and see, you know, different trends, different shopping trends, um, different con information and content consumption trends. Hey, you know, what's interesting is I bet you um, the context of what's going on politically and socially changes the interaction that you just said, you know, oh, it's near Halloween time, so now they're focused on the mask instead of other stuff. But mm -hmm. it'll be interesting if you can correlate for brands what's trending in the news and what's happening in the current environment. And then, you know, you have their library and show them ways, oh, you know, this content piece that came out a few months ago, now is probably a good time to put it back out because this is happening in the news and exactly. we think that'll increase engagement, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at scale, that's what we're looking at, right? The goal of our company is to create this at scale and create this kind of new marketplace for publishers and advertisers to leverage the visual content, you know, and to look at the ongoing data, to inform content production, to recirculate, to take advantage of uh, viral events, to take advantage of monetization opportunities. And like you said, trend cycles, even politically, where you're seeing, you know, this is in the news right now. Well, we also use our technology to recirculate um, additional content. So what we found is on some of our publisher sites where you use the context of the video to generate audience development across other content pieces. 
So for example, you just reference like a political event. If you're reading, you're watching something about the current political you know, situation and you want to learn more about certain bills that are being passed or certain political parties or candidates, you may be able to click on that exact you know, person and it may take you to another article on their platform. So it increases the circulation of that media property's content itself. So you're leveraging your current content to then constantly recommend new content and allow the viewers to dive deeper into the context of what you're discussing. Um, and it's really cool because, you know, it's a new way to look at monetization as well, because you're not really surfacing an ad, but what you're doing is you're recirculating that viewer onto another page to read more content and then generating ad revenue off of, you know, increased page view and time on site. So we don't necessarily always have to have a direct line of a commerce experience to help generate revenue. It could be through, you know, generate additional traffic on site and recircling it um, to keep them on there longer. Yeah, if, uh, I don't know, if a new movie comes out in a series or a new book by a certain author, you could also say, hey, there's other other books by this author, there's other videos in this series, there's related yep. content, I mean, all kinds of stuff. Exactly. That's really interesting. Do you yeah, have uh, any examples of, um, of brands that you see are really like, taking this to the next level and doing all this and, you know, what kind of effects are they having? Yeah, I think, you know, for brands, there's a lot of brands out there who are very innovative and take on new technology providers. You know, there's that release right now of uh, brands on Instagram going with like different shoppable uh, Instagram and visual posts and being at the forefront of social commerce. Um, and they're doing really well. You know, brands that do, um, I can't remember who were there. They picked, I think, 23 different brands um, that are leveraging this platform. But I think, you know, more of the forward and innovative brands are seeing that if you leverage the actual visual content um, across all these different platforms, that it's a better way to engage audiences and then drive traffic to additional commerce or information purposes. Um, and for us, you know, I think across the board, you know, we can connect to a lot of different brands via different networks um, that represent, you know, thousands of brands through there. So it gives us a chance to optimize for what's inside the video um, with all the different brands and audiences. So what may work with one site where a brand may do really well could be completely different on another audience. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So um, it's really cool. I, it's hard for me to imagine all the implications and all the ways this will be used. And I'm sure you're figuring out new ways as you go. But yeah. very cool technology. Interesting. Thank um, you. Thank you, yeah. So what's ahead for the next year or so with your platform like what is it more of a rollout or new features or what's happening yeah for us i'd say you know we're really getting into ott and connected tv that is next for us and i see a lot of movement from you know linear tv to changing over to more of the over-the-top televisions and connected devices there's a lot of investment and a lot of kind of bets on you know the uh, video the advertising video on demand platforms and i think for us being able to create additional metadata for those devices um, is going to create all new ad experiences. You know, I know like right now, Viacom, uh, Roku, Amazon, all of them are getting into the AVOD space um, and looking at, you know, technology providers like us to create new ad experiences, not just on desktop and mobile, but for um, different OTT experiences and Apple TV and all these different kind of Roku, et cetera. So for us, I'd say bridging that gap between TV and digital and bringing kind of a visual search component for viewers at home to be able to engage and shop content um, is something we're excited about. Yeah, well, very good. And what's the best way for folks to uh, to get in touch, whether they're you know, a brand, big or small, or they're just interested yeah, in but, seeing the effects of what your platform can do? Sure, they can always visit us. You know, it's, it's wowyow, W-O-W-Y-O-W.com. Um, they can reach out to me directly either on LinkedIn, I'm there a lot, um, or by email. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Jared, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was good to talk to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Richard. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, 
or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.